Yeah. Good evening, everyone. How, how wonderful to be here. This is uh, one of several events that we've organized during Collect. Uh, this is our version of Collect. It's taken place in our studio for a variety of reasons, not least the pandemic. And it's been very worthwhile and very successful. And we're very, very grateful to all the artists who've worked so hard to produce this outstanding exhibition. Uh, this evening, we've got a panel of uh, artists who work in our studio from time to time, some of them more than others. They are specialists in cold working in one form or another. So with Tim Rawlinson, Anthony Scala, and Silo Yussel. We're absolutely thrilled to be here. By the way, I'm Peter Layton, just in case anyone. I, I realized last time I did this, I didn't even introduce myself. So, Tim, uh, why don't you tell us, yeah, would you introduce yourself in first instance? Oh, thank you, Peter. My name's Tim Rawlinson. Tonight we're here to talk about glass sculpture. I mean, particularly sculpting the glass when it's cold. Uh, that's my main language in glass of working it in its cold state, sort of polished surfaces, uh, cutting especially, I think is the main thing. And once, once you've cut a piece of glass, that facet is no longer transparent. It, it's opaque, so you'll have to work it quite a long time, uh, very studiously through different grades of grit to get it back to a high optical polish. Uh, it's not necessarily an exciting uh, process, but hopefully the effects are very exciting. And I think that's the main thing with everything that we do. I mean, the rock and roll side of glasses, the glass blowing, the, the, the fire, the heat, the sweat, the drama. Uh, but the, uh, the editing suite, <laughs> the cold shot, it uh, you know, has no small part to play in the glass world. And I think some of the most significant pieces you see here have been heavily worked upon cold. Uh, there's a piece of Colin Reed just to my left here, a very large cast optical piece of glass that when people walk through the door, that's probably one of the first things they're hit by. Uh, and the magnificence of it is due to its highly polished surface. It creates this wonderful mirrored effect. And Colin is probably the sort of standout uh, glass artist in this country, recognized across the world. And that is through his highly polished optical surfaces. So whilst the process of cold working itself might not be that flashy. The end result is truly spectacular, in my opinion. There's a series I've been working on for a number of years called Echoes of Light, which is cut through colored circular piece, reveals the inner layers within, and there's various illusions within it. So, the colors may not actually be the true ones that they appear to be. So you might have a yellow overlaid on top of a blue to create the illusion of a green. And I just like to invite a viewer in to give greater investigation to the work and try and understand what it is that they're actually seeing, whether their eyes are betraying them or it's just the interplay between glass and light. And I think that's probably what drew me to the process of cold working. The best way to exploit the interplay of glass and light is by highly polished glass surfaces or lenses. I really enjoy that fact of taking a large lump of glass, cutting through it, usually on a diagonal, and I feel it create, the, especially the diagonal cut creates much more sort of tension within the work. And then the curvature of the inner bubble will suddenly become distorted and elongated. So the piece that you're looking at the moment is called Parallax, which is new for the show and has proven very popular. The external form has a, is a twisted uh, rectangular form. And it's quite nice that you then have the smooth inside of the bubble with this exterior twist. So then when you look on top of it, what is a single bubble will suddenly deviate and move in many different directions. 
which I quite like how it plays with the perception of what you were seeing. I also like the idea of pathways in life. They could deviate in many different directions. Chaos of uh, our own pathways in life might splinter and go in completely different ways than we would have expected. Uh, continuing with this theme is the piece Singularity, uh, which is next to it, which is suspended spiral throughout. No time. Again, Not the fact that it's one singular bubble, but when you look at the exterior twisted form, you get many different routes and pathways pulsating off. I think that one of the key things with my pieces is how thick and clear they are. The transparency of glass, I find, you know, to, it's its primary characteristic, but it's most important one for me in terms of how letting the glass do the talking, let it sing. And I like to suspend the different layers between the clear glass so it almost appears as if they're floating within, gives it a sort of liquid quality, which I really enjoy. The pieces that I've shown you already, they've been blown glass. Um, and I've been working on cast glass pieces the past couple of years. We've been very fortunate here at London Glass Blowing to have received a grant from a foundation called Alcea, and they enabled us to uh, build a much larger cold working facility than we had previously. And it's enabled works like the one you're seeing to happen of uh, cast glass so rather than a blown piece the more the glass is put into a pre-made mold which then goes into a kiln it gets hot again the glass melts and takes the shape of the mold uh, and what intrigues me to the process is you can see these wisps of color almost like uh, seaweed or bits of uh, reeds underwater moving with the current and I love the chaotic factor of this colour. Inside of the mould, when it's hot in a kiln, the glass is pulled in different directions. I don't have any control of that. I know that the different colours will work in different ways when they're hot, but I really like the fact that it's an unknown of what comes out. I have the control of this geometric architectural shape as the exterior, but to have the freedom of the colour within to flow and move almost like ink does on liquid is what really excites me about the process. And like I say, we've only been able to really start to push this due to the enhanced facility, which is again thanks to our SEER Foundation. So I work in there most of the time with Scylla, who's one of the guests tonight. And uh, Anthony was, has been working for Peter for nearly 20 years? This is my 23rd year I've been associated professionally. 23rd year, so uh, I've, I've been here for 10 years. And Anthony, you know, when I came, Anthony was a few people at work I knew. I was very excited to meet him. One of the sort of stalwarts within the cold working fraternity in this country. And I think Peter, I think mean, you've been quite blessed really with the cold workers you've had over the years. Certainly, uh, you know, in terms of balancing the scales of blown glass artists to people who are working glass in the cold way, but to come here and have someone like Anthony working in of that caliber, but maybe not necessarily have the facilities to achieve the ideas, is something that I feel has been rectified in the past few years and means that. Our ambition is no longer limited by the machinery we have available. And that's really exciting. I mean, it's what more can an artist ask for except for the ability to create what's inside of your head, or at least hopefully. In saying that, I'd like to hand over to Anthony. Thank you. Thank you, Tim. Actually, going back to those, um, gosh, all those years ago when Tim first joined the studio. Halcyon days. Yeah, <laughs> it, was, it, was, it was quite refreshing to find somebody who was actually interested in the backstage aspect of glassblowing. As Tim's pointed out, it is very rock and roll. You know, it's like the action on the stage. That's where people's attention is focused. But there is a significant amount of work that goes on backstage. Um, and... 
one of the things I learned pretty early on, particularly with cold working and doing minor repairs, is that the most you can ever hope to achieve is that nobody will see your work. So if that, I think you'll, you'll agree with that one. I'll speak a little bit about my my work and my, my, my process now. So I've been associated professionally with the London Glass Blowing since 1999. And I came straight from college uh, and I trained as an architectural model maker. And the thing about architectural model making is that it is exceedingly precise. Um, there is absolutely no margin for error. And when I started working at London Glass Blowing, in many ways it was incredibly refreshing to, you know, come to a studio where you're, you know, essentially sketching on the blowing iron and creating these kind of amorphous shapes and responding immediately to what to what the material is doing. However, that was that was completely contrary to my training. And some of my early tests were to see if that level of architectural accuracy could be translated into glass, which is probably one of the most unforgiving materials on the planet once it's cold. And I just wanted to see if you could work it, grind it, polish it in the same way you could wood or metal um, or plastics. And to my delight, um, yes, you can do that. Uh, so that was really the beginning of my obsession, I suppose you'd call it, with cold working. Of course, you know, being young and naive, I kind of assumed I was the only person in the world doing it. Um, I soon learned that that was absolutely not the case. Um, in fact, you know, I do remember going to uh, Plateau Gallery at the time that was doing an exhibition of Slovak work. And Peter sent me, sent me along to this gallery. And I swaggered in there thinking let's see what these Slovak guys can do and I took one look at the work and I felt sick you know I just thought I have got so much more to learn from this which is a very sobering thing and actually that has kept me motivated and inspired for the past 20 years you know I'm always comparing what I make with what I saw that first time and in my opinion it's it's never got there it's never quite been to that level so you know as Tim was saying that the, the you know the aspect of cold working is that you're taking this glass um, and then you're cutting it and grinding it um, and you know taking it from this almost opaque uh looking material all the way through to an optical polish and for me it's the physics of the optics which I find absolutely fascinating so I have three pieces um, in my uh, collection for the London glass blowing exhibition it's part of a brand new range of work called abstract geometry and it's an extension, I suppose, of some work that I, 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 I really began just before lockdown. Um, and it was exploring these, these geometric um, eight-sided shapes, these octahedrons. So these are multi-faceted, uh, multi-layered pieces um, with a layer of polychromatic glass in the middle, a dichroic layer, which only allows certain frequencies of light through. So that what they tend to do is reflect light in one particular colour um, and transmit in, a, in, in another one. And that's part of the magic of this, this type of glass. So these were actually the very first pieces I made in my new studio space, which came about through lockdown. Um, I think, you know, like everybody, you know, you, 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 plow on with the working world and then all of a sudden COVID happened and and you know we were thrown into disarray and for me I actually got something very positive out of it it gave me time to step outside of my working world and really concentrate on developing my own studio which you know I could really dedicate to this kind of work um, so these are the as I mentioned these are the first pieces that have come out of that of that um, of that new studio space I use a very specific type 
of optical epoxy. Um, and laminating in wintertime as opposed to summertime, the viscosity is completely different. The curing time can alter by as much as 14 hours. Um, the other issue is cleaning the material off. Just, you know, if, you're, if, if you have a piece of glass that's in a cold room, and you try cleaning it off when the glue hasn't set properly, you'll get a myriad of air bubbles just appear in it because there are micro bubbles in that glass which are which can be completely invisible until you begin warming the glass with your hands. And then all of a sudden, there it is. It's like aero. And, you know, there's nothing you can do about it at that point. So it's a very challenging uh, chemistry to get right. Um, there are lots of tricks that you can that you can employ, but there is no universal rule. Um, and I think that's, that's, that's the most important lesson I've learned, that every type of new work, you know, you, you may not go back to square one, but it's, you know, the rules that work with one style of work are not going to work with another. So and I think Silla's probably uh, come across some of this as well. In fact, that might be quite a good opportunity to pass over to Silla now. Yeah, um, I was lucky to be given a masterclass in lamination this summer, or in the previous summer from Anthony. And um, I already knew it was really, really complicated. But um, some of the things that Anthony spoke to me about while he was showing me the process were things I didn't even think were possible but um yeah i'm um i'm a cast based artist so most of my work i mean all of my work is basically cold working i don't touch the glass when it's hot at all so i start off with uh, i'll make a plaster cast to go into the kiln and that will involve me uh, making a model that can go into the plaster and create a negative so I'll 3d print a design that I want to make out of glass uh, cast that in plaster and then remove the model so that I'm left with the negative once that's done I can load that into the kiln and put cold glass on top of it and leave the kiln on for a week and it will melt into that shape and I'm left with the shape that I want to make out of glass once the kiln firing is done, I'm able to remove the piece from the plaster and then the real cold working begins. I'm left with a lot of overspill, so I have to grind all that surface away, which will take a few hours. And then I'm left with the shape that I actually want. I'm then going towards the lamination process, which is really similar to what Anthony does. And I'll have to polish the surface that I'm going to laminate. And like Anthony said, it's really, really important that surface is flat because if it's slightly bowed, when you join the two halves together, you'll get that bowed. It won't sit flat on it and you lose that sharp edge that you're looking for in the final piece. So once it's laminated, that will need to cure for a week. And then you're left with all this sort of poxy over the glass and I can really start to see how my piece is going to look after this stage. I can then grind it all off and then I'm left with the actual piece and it's the first time I really have any idea of what my piece is going to look like. It's a very different process glass casting compared to glass blowing. I can't just knock out tests um, and do lots of trials to see how my work's going to look. It's a lot of guessing and that's why I 3D print things. It's to give me an idea of how my work's going to look. The actual inspiration for my work will generally come from the natural curiosity that I have for geometry. And geometry is so satisfying to look at because it makes shapes dependable. And as humans, we find that comforting because it means that they're predictable and it makes us feel safe, which is why I'm drawn to it. Once I, I'll sort of start off with a cube as a basic structure, which is why I always work with it. And then I will dissect it in a way that I find interesting. Sometimes that's a random cut and sometimes it's a quite a complex cut, but I will use color to exaggerate this and sort of create these internal structures. I think that glass as a material adds a lot of depth to these pieces and light and movement will sort of 
highlight and blur these cuts and structures that I've created inside the shape. I like that I would encourage the viewer to move around the piece as they're looking at it because of these sort of blurred lines and not quite knowing what's going on inside the piece. I like that the viewer will have this playful interaction with it. I ask you, Scylla, about... So my work is quite highly polished, sort of when I get that final optical polish. Yours, you, you seem to enjoy that semi-translucency, that intrigue, that sort of cloudiness with the glass. Could you explain a bit about the surface? Yes, so I hand polish all of my surfaces because I don't trust machines to do it for me because I believe that the shape will potentially, I've had bad experiences with the shape, um, with it going out of shape. And I'll hand polish this, which can take quite a while, quite a lot longer than using it, than just using a machine. And the reason that I leave it with a matted finish is because I like that it gives the piece a glow and it gives it an element of mystery. It holds the light in that way, doesn't it? Yeah, exactly. And I have polished them completely transparent before as a test and I, I really, I didn't like it as much. I remember when I got it to the finest polish before it became transparent, that was when I engaged with the piece the most and I just found it really exciting and interesting because I could move it around and from every angle it looked different. Whereas when it was transparent, I could just see what it was. And I thought that the color being blurred made it a really interesting piece. So I think that's why I leave it matted. Um, I don't know if we have any questions coming from the audience. Uh, we've, we've got people listening in from pretty much all over the world, as I understand it. So it would be nice. If you do have any questions, please use the chat box. Is that, I, I, is that I'd the like way to, to do ask it? you a question, Peter. Oh, right. In terms of, obviously, our specialty, the three of us, is working the glass cold. Uh, I don't really think you have a lane. Obviously, <laughs> glass blowing is your sort of main language, but you've worked in a whole myriad of different processes since I've been here, and even longer across your 40 decades in glass? Longer? Yes, over that. Uh, not 40 decades. <laughs> Sorry, four <laughs> decades, 40 years. <laughs> I know I'm quite old, Tim. It's getting, it's getting on. Yeah. Uh, no, yeah, I just wanted to know a bit about your sort of take on the process and things that you've been able to do uh, with us. And yeah. So my new nickname is Methuselah. And... Uh, no, I listen. It the whole journey, the whole period of working uh, in glass, and and particularly the evolution of London glass blowing over over several decades, has been. Uh, it's uh, as I think I said uh, somewhere else recently. It's been a journey of a lifetime. I think that was the title of a talk I gave to the Contemporary Glass Society, and and. Uh, What's been wonderful has been to be able to share that journey with all the various people that have passed through the studio over the years. Uh, something must work because people do stick around for a long time and, and the time goes by or ever faster in my case. Um, you know, I, I can hardly believe you've been here three years. And you've been here 10 years. And Anthony, you've been working, you've been around for over 20, you said. Yes, my God, that's, that, that is, uh, I do... I do take that as some sort of indication that things have worked one way or another. In answer to your question, yes, I've really enjoyed the way the cold, cold working has developed. Partly, I mean, largely thanks to you. I mean, uh, I first met Tim at um, a student show at the Brisbane Design Centre some years ago. He, um, he nobbled me. And he said, uh, he said, have you got a job? He said, no, but you could come and do a little bit of work experience with us. And uh, a bit like Anthony, he never left, and which is great because not only is he a fantastic colleague and uh, has helped me enormously with my work, he uh, happens to be my son-in-law and uh, about to become the father of uh, 
literally tomorrow morning, I think, <laughs> of, uh, of a grandchild. So perhaps, do you want to elaborate on that by any chance, just to give us a bit of uh, context? <laughs> Uh, yeah. Well, origins. <laughs> uh, my wife Sophie, Pete's daughter. Uh, yeah, we're being induced for our first baby tomorrow morning, so we're very excited. Bless her. She's uh, into her, I think nearly her forty-third week of pregnancy, so it's getting a bit fed up. But, uh, she does have work in the show, uh, and one of the reasons I was sort of asking Peter about the process was to touch on surface treatment, surface decoration. You've got the sculptural element of cold working, how we sort of cut these large forms up, but then you can be much more sort of uh, delicate or intricate. Sophie here has sandblasted away this white exterior to reveal these coloured patches within, and then she's actually painted onto the surface and then it's fired on this enamel. But she's a printmaker as an origin of artist, and these are then fired on decals. You then uh, have someone like Bruce, who has a etched matte finish, and then Peter, who's created pieces with an etched matte exterior, but with a polished face to see within. So this sort of idea of surface treatment or decoration with the glass is really pivotal. Uh, I think we've got to wind up shortly, but I, I just wanted to ask whether you could uh, say anything at all about your aspirations. Where, where do you visualize your... How do you visualize your glass art? evolving or developing in the future or how do you see it vis-a-vis -vis art in general and uh, yeah why don't you go first I'll go first if that's okay I mean it that I would say that for me lockdown has taught me one thing it's not plan that far ahead I mean I think we all had plans. We'd all we all had like a one-year plan, a three-year plan, a five-year plan. What our work was, what it was, what it was going to become, almost in this kind of methodical kind of way. Lockdown happened. It threw through everything, you know, to the you know to the four corners really, to four winds. And um, and yeah, we all had to reevaluate how we worked, what we were able to do. And I think a lot of creativity came out of that I mean I remember particularly during that first lockdown really enjoying how creative people were being on social media with projects you know because all of a sudden they had all this time on their hands and I think it was a it was a wonderful example of how as a species we are innately creative and and the and and what we can use, what wonderful um, resources we have at our disposal for that creativity. So um, so yeah, I, I I would say, don't be too tunnel visioned in in how your how your um, you know how your work is going to progress. Um, be um, what's the word? Open open to new avenues that you would never have thought of. Anyway, enough from me. <laughs> See that? Um, yeah, I feel like I feel like part of me is still like, well, I'm waiting for this to end, and I'll just end up doing graphic design again. So every year is just exciting for me, and trying new ideas. That I know I've got some ideas, but I'm not going to share them yet. But I'm definitely going to get bigger and better. I think. <laughs> I, I really like your PowerPoint, seeing the individual pieces before the laminated together. I am quite drawn to them as much as I am the finished pieces. And I think there's, uh, yeah. there's quite a lot of scope with your components. Yeah, I do. Actually, I agree. I, when they come out of the kiln and they're cast as separate pieces, I do get quite attached to them I'm like oh do I really want to make it into a square like <laughs> <laughs> actually that's a very good point as cold workers we have that sense of that there are many many stages to our to our final pieces and often 
those stages can be off, it can be more interesting than, than than our final destination, and that can lead to, to to future projects and future bodies of work. The process of coal work, as Anthony said, is it, it can be so long winded, and can I mean Anthony's at probably one of the more complex levels, but the time it takes to produce pieces means if there's a show I'll work six months to a year in advance to know to create a certain body of work the amount of time that that will take me I have to be thinking that far in advance with things um, so at the moment I've kind of rounded up most of my shows I've got quite a few things going on in America at the moment which is very exciting it's a new glass market that I'm opening up into uh, but I expect to be changing diapers and uh, <laughs> all the other duties of a new father so uh, yeah the future looks loud it looks messy <laughs> <laughs> oh, well on that note I think we're going to draw this to a close Anthony, Scylla, my beloved son-in-law. <laughs> no, that sounds a bit soppy, doesn't it, Tim? Uh, <laughs> Peter's like, very excited about becoming a granddad I, again. I, I, think. I am, I am. Yeah, the, the, this is the biggest bit of all this lockdown creativity that, uh, that you were talking about. It's coming to fruition. Anyway, I'm, uh, thank you so much for joining us. We've... I've enjoyed listening to this. I hope you have. It's been quite an eye opener, and I've. Uh, I hope you will take another look at our online catalogue because some, as I said earlier, some of this work is still available. Uh, we've enjoyed the evening, and I hope you have. And uh, let's hope this horrible thing that's going on in Ukraine comes to a, a swift end. It's not and a positive one. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you.